we didn't think of a good starter for this. I love this French word that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> I love this technique. I love this, I don't know. Hey, everybody. Bloop, boop, boop. Bloop, boop, boop. Bloop, boop, boop. I love this guy. <laughs> well, hi, I'm Michael. I'm Molly. And today we are going to be chatting about a concept that we talked a lot about in our last video together. And that concept is vocal color. It's a little bit hard to explain what we mean by that in a short, concise way. So we figured let's just riff on it for a bit and go off on a longer video about it. So when we say vocal color, we mean the timbre of a voice, but that sort of gets us to another point. What does timbre mean? So it's a French word and it basically means the quality of a sound. I saw something that basically defined it as any musical quality that is not the duration or the pitch. Or the volume. Or the volume. What did you say? The oboeness of the oboe? <laughs> right. The oboeness of the oboe or the violinness of the violin. Back when I was a college professor, I had a class where I was trying to explain the concept of timbre, and I played a note on the piano, and then I sang the same note, and I asked my students, what's the difference between those two sounds? One student said, well, one's in tune. <laughs> but really what I was getting at is the timbre is what's different. So a violin playing one pitch and an oboe playing the exact same pitch will sound different because they have different timbres. It's the sound of the sound. Physics-wise, I'm going to give a very, very brief explanation of this because this is something that I actually don't know super well either. But every sound is made up of many sounds, actually. There's one sound that you mostly hear, that's the fundamental, and then there'll be other sounds that, you, that are higher frequency and lower frequency that are happening at the same time that you don't really hear usually, but which of those are louder and which of those are softer determine the timbre of the sound. So like for double reed instruments, like an oboe or a bassoon, their upper fundamentals that are louder mm -hmm. are all clustered together in the same mm -hmm. spot because they both mm -hmm. have the same nasally reedy right. sound. And so when we're talking about voices, to me, it's sort of like if somebody calls you on the phone back in the days before we had caller ID and you didn't know who was going to be on the other side of the phone when you answered and you could pick up the phone and you could go like oh that's Michael right because of the sound of your voice versus oh that's Ramin because Ramin has a lower darker voice than you if I see somebody's face the little qualities in like everybody has eyes and well almost everybody has eyes and a nose and a mouth right and a forehead and cheeks but like the subtle ch differences in their forehead and the shape of their eyes and the sides of their nose and all of this are what make me go like, oh, that's that individual person. And your voice has these little markers in it too. Your voice might be more raspy, more clean, more dark, more bright, more um, high or low, uh, just sort of in where it sits. There are a lot of things <laughs> that go into that. I think an interesting next step would be for us to just talk about some popular singers mm. and talk about what their voices sound like. I was thinking one of the easiest ones to start off with would be, although a lot of female pop singers do this, one easy example is Billie Eilish for mm. singing with a breathy mm -hmm. tone. Yes, yes. It's almost a whisper, yeah. right? And so the way that she's doing that is that her vocal cords are not closing all the way so that a little bit more air escapes when she sings versus when when the vocal cords are closing all the way and, and you're getting a nice clean sound. She's letting more air through. Like it is with many vocal color things, that's one of the ones that is a choice. And mm -hmm. it's, it's common in the style to make that choice. And we know that she can turn that on and off because we've heard her do it. Who else has a really interesting timbre? <laughs> Somebody that I think of that we've talked about on this channel a lot is Lucy Dacus, whose voice does have a little bit of that airiness to it, but it's also a very dark voice. And what do I mean when I say dark? What I mean is that the voice has a shadowiness to it, which also sounds like dark. <laughs> the voice has a roundness to it. It's sort of like a dark voice might sound more like this. And a bright voice might sound more like this. And so there, Molly was doing two things. She was changing both the pitch and the timbre. But they do tend to go together in a lot of instruments yeah, and voices. Yeah, Well, and Aunt Lucy has a lower voice, yeah. right? Versus like her bandmate, Julian Baker, who has a very bright voice, mm -hmm. right? And her voice is more nasally and it's more here. And what's interesting about Boy Genius is when the three voices come together, because I think Phoebe kind of 
splits the difference mm-hmm. between them, it blends into this really rich sound because you have that mix of timbres. Another voice that I think would be interesting to talk about would be Britney Spears. Oh, yes. Well, so Britney Spears, especially in her first album, did a lot of vocal fry, mm-hmm. right? And, and vocal fry is a hot topic because a lot of people like to talk about why they hate it and then other people talk about why it's sexist to hate vocal fry. But what vocal fry is, is basically when you are sort of pitching your voice lower than it can naturally go, and I actually just did it a little bit there <laughs> unintentionally. And so it creates a beat. So it's like this. It's like if I were trying to do an impression of a little old lady whose voice is starting to get all crickety, right? Yeah. <laughs> or it's it's that Kim Kardashian like, oh my God, I cannot believe she is wearing that. <laughs> Britney Spears used to go, oh baby, baby. But we all do it, yeah. right? It's just a part of the natural sort of shading, right? Because we all speak with a lot of different different colors in our voice, right? Like I get really, my voice gets really high and bright when I'm excited. Um, and, and it gets really low and like weird when I think I'm being funny. What female pop singer <laughs> sings fairly full voiced? Whitney Houston. Okay, that's a good example. Whitney Houston is is an example of like, like the opposite of the Billie Eilish thing where it's a very breathy sound. Whitney Houston's vocal cords are closing cleanly, precisely, and are working at the highest efficiency that they can. What it means is you have a sound that is so resonant, it's almost like, uh, I've been thinking about how I want to describe this recently because I was thinking about the voices that do this. Celine Dion is one, the Lucius Girls. The sound rings, Mm -hmm. right? It almost rings more than it feels like a vibration or a wind instrument. What do I mean by a ringing? Listen to the sound and listen to those singers and tell me what you think. And when you're talking about Whitney Houston's voices, you say that her voice is dark. What do you mean by that? Whitney Houston's voice is dark and by that I mean it has a richness to it. It has a roundness to it. Her voice has this mystifying quality that I think any of us can relate to if we've ever tried to sing along with her, like in the car or at karaoke or whatever, which is that you go, oh, this is a, a song that I can sing with because it's it's pitched reasonably well where I can sing it. And then you realize it's much higher than it sounds. It does this auditory illusion where it sounds like the pitches are lower and they're actually very high. If you were yourself trying to make a darker sound versus a brighter sound, what mm-hmm. physiologically are you doing? Yeah, that's really interesting because voices are kind of weird because we just sort of do it and we don't really know that we're doing it, right? Just like, how do you, how do you change the pitch in your voice? Well, you just think the pitch and it comes out for most people. Some people struggle with it a little more to change the quality of the voice. Like, so I'm speaking in like a pretty neutral place right now. If I wanted to make it brighter, I might incorporate more of the resonant space in the front of my face around my nose and sinuses. What is resonant space? If you have an electric guitar and it's a solid body electric guitar and you don't have it plugged into any amplification and you pluck a string, it just sort of goes poing and and the sound doesn't really go anywhere. If you have an acoustic guitar where it has that big wooden box behind the strings and a little hole in it, and you pluck the string on that, it pung, it rings. And so it's that big hollow box that creates the resonance. Now, we have very small hollow boxes in our skulls and also your entire skull itself. So your resonance comes from the palate in your mouth, right? So if you look at the anatomy of the inside of your mouth, there is the... The hard part and the soft part. <laughs> yeah, you feel you can feel... There's your teeth and the space behind your teeth. There are all these sinuses here and here and then the holes in your nose and that is your resonance space so you can use them all in different ways i can open up uh, you know the space in my mouth as much as possible to make a darker sound 
right? Or I can close it off and I can send that sound through here and make a brighter sound. Yeah. You can use this, right? If you're a musician or if, if you are an actor or if you are, you know, there's lots of, of different ways to use this to add dimension. I think of like the classic like Wicked Witch of the mm. West sound, that bright <laughs> nasal sound. I'll get you, my pretty. And Gandalf, you shall not pass. Yeah. If you want to fool around with this, I would start by just speaking in character voices, right? Like, how do you make the sound of a little old lady? How do you make the sound if, of your woman? How do you pretend to sound like a man? Or um, how do you imitate an opera singer? As we how do you, about. oh yeah. So th this is something people do a lot. They, they're like, this is my fake opera voice. And you're like, no, that's a real opera voice. That's <laughs> actually, that's how we do it. You can experiment with the shape of your mouth. Our language has lots of colors in it. We call them vowels. The vowels are determined by the shape of your mouth and your tongue placement basically when you're making the sound. So we have bright vowels and dark vowels. Dark vowels would be something like ah and oh. Those vowels have a dark sound and the bright vowels would be like e and a. You can experiment with going e Do that, feel where your tongue moves, feel how the shape of your mouth changes, the shape of your lips change, and then you can incorporate those shapes into anything. Right, and even within each of those vowels, you can change the brightness and darkness of the sound. It's probably easiest to do with right. an ah with vowel. With an ah, ah, And in some languages, not so much in English, but in some languages, like the different vowel, like a, a dark A versus a bright A might yeah. mean different things. Or like, also... Like in, in French diction class, we were saying, voila, la salade, because they're all <laughs> voilà, bright la salade. <laughs> well, and French is a great example, because French also has the nasal vowels. So you can sort of experiment with like going, Ah, right? Yeah. Like into those that nasal space. I also, when I'm thinking about color in my own voice, I imagine that the sound is a tiny ping pong ball. And where I'm aiming that mm -hmm. is where mm -hmm. the sound is. So like if I want a brighter sound, I imagine I'm like shooting it at my front teeth. Mm -hmm. If I want a darker sound, I imagine it's like above my soft palate. Yeah, and then you can also think about where your voice, what its natural quality is and where you might want to balance that. I feel like I have a naturally dark voice. And so when I'm singing, especially when I'm doing, you know, professional work as a classical singer, I'm often trying to counteract that by doing just what you said, aiming that sound forward through the front of my teeth so that the darkness, the natural darkness of my voice is counteracted by that focal point in the front. The thing about singing and voices is that you only learn how to manipulate it by, you know, through experimentation. And imitation. Um, and, and, and feeling what it, what it sounds like. And also you have to record yourself and listen because you don't know what you're saying. Anybody who has heard their voice recorded knows that the way your voice sounds outside is not what it sounds like inside your head. Okay, so we've talked about what the different colors mean and, and a very quick primer on how to produce some different colors. But now how as a someone who is creating music for vocalist, either for yourself or for another vocalist. Why? What are they for? One particularly cool piece of music that uses vocal color as a really integral part of what the music is, is a piece called Partita for Eight Voices by composer Caroline Shaw. Caroline finished composition of this piece in 2012. It was composed for the vocal group Roomful of Teeth, and it was released on their 2012 self-titled debut album. This piece also won a Pulitzer Prize for Shaw, in 2013. As I said, vocal color is really one of the huge important structural pieces of this piece of music. And I think that's most notable in the fourth movement, Passacaglia. I'm going to play some examples of this here and hopefully I'll be able to do this without getting any copyright strikes. But I want you to listen to how really the only thing that's happening is vocal color changes in this and how exciting that actually makes it.
but this isn't only used in music that we might now consider classical music. This is also used in pop and rock music, and I think one really cool example of that is the band Dirty Projectors, especially in their 2009 album Bitta Orca. There's a track in Bitta Orca that has some really exciting color changes in the vocals that really breathe a shot of excitement into this song it's in the song useful chamber so i'm going to play a a little bit of this one too but if for some reason i'm not able to have these clips on here please check the description i have links to recordings of both of these that i think are really cool and you should check out In the Music in 2024 so far video, we were talking about Another Sky and the lead singer's voice in that. Now, a lot of what she does with the colors of her voice are more to do with range because of how big the difference of her, the sound of her voice is in different ranges. But her voice also has a unique inherent color. Yes. It's very dark. It is also quite breathy. Mm -hmm. It has a silvery quality to it. Mm -hmm. A sort of effervescent sparkle. (laughs) So so here we go doing a a thing that a lot of musicians do is talking about sounds as if they were things that are not sound related. So like Uh, colors or... I mean, I've talked a lot on here about sparkle guitar. Yeah, texture. (laughs) We have... a lot of musicians will talk about things and it sounds in terms of textures. Yeah, you could say it's uh, rough, velvety, uh, smooth, yeah, um, buttery. Um, food things come up a lot. Yes. Um, creamy. Yes. It's um, yeah, it's creamy. It's like a bracing shot of vodka. You acidic. Know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> things like that come up a lot when you're talking with musicians about sound. Oh yeah, we were talking about Willow. Oh yeah. So Willow, if you watch her tiny desk concert, you can hear how she is intentionally manipulating the color of her sound You can also see her doing it, which is really helpful because you see her going, making her, um, the shape of her mouth go more this way Mm -hmm. and even exposing her teeth so that the sound can ring against them Mm -hmm. versus relaxing everything down when she gets that really luscious uh, dark sound. And we talked about how playing with the timbre of your voice like that is something that's done more commonly in jazz. Mm -hmm. So if you listen to a lot of great jazz Mm -hmm. singers, they'll be doing that too. It's also more common in a lot of non-Western music. I was just going to say, as you were talking about Willow, I, I thought of another really great example is Tank and the Bangas, Mm -hmm. and how their singer, you know, will create this sort of bright, high, thin voice, but then will sometimes open it up to her full, the full richness of her voice, which is actually quite dark. And I believe that is her true voice. And she does really interesting things with that. Yeah. Yeah. Especially because she incorporates a lot of speech, spoken word into her music. And you hear her doing that in her speech as well as her singing. But you know, Kendrick Lamar will do that. He'll do that. Oh, oh." like he'll do that like weird thing where he gets into this weird space up here. His general sort of natural speaking voice is quite bright and high. Yeah. If you listen to Doja Cat, she plays with the timbre yes. of her voice a lot too, whether she's singing or rapping. Mm. All right, so that was kind of a lot. It's all nonsense. It's oh, all yeah. subjective, it's right? All... It's what you hear. But it's also so much fun to play with. So I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to play with timbre in your own music that you're creating, whether you are singing someone else's music or you are creating your own music for someone to sing or for yourself to sing. Lots of fun stuff to think about if you want to go down that road. Leave some ideas in the comments or people you want to bring up or questions you might have. I'll do my best to answer as not a professional singer. But yeah, thank you so much for watching. Please give this video a like if you liked it or give it a pity like if you didn't like it. Two, this side is a video that YouTube thinks you might like, so check that out. Up there in the corner is the link to our channel. We put out videos once a week, typically, of reviews, rankings, ramblings about media that we love. And that should be about it. Maintain your groovy selves.